Okay, good afternoon all. I think uh, just looking, most people have, have joined by now. So uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, let me introduce myself first of all. My name is Lee McCartan, for those of you who haven't met me. I'm one of the directors of Engineers Without Borders um, in Ireland. And so welcome to our continued uh, webinar series about exploring resilience and resilient communities in a post-COVID world. Uh, so delighted today to say we have a very interesting uh, speaker uh, joining us from Barcelona, Ricardo Mastini. And Ricardo is a PhD candidate in political ecology and ecological economics at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, which is quite a grand uh, introduction. Um, but the reason Ricardo is with us is Ricardo has been working for a number of years uh, and part of his PhD is around degrowth. And Ricardo has been working as a policy advisor for such things as the Green New Deal in Europe and also with various NGOs and Friends of the Earth Europe. So Ricardo is going to, going to share his, his thoughts, his experiences um, around the whole area of degrowth and hopefully explain what it is, uh, first of all, and how it can uh, possibly form a framework or not. Uh, and hopefully at the end, maybe prompt a little bit of uh, discussion uh, and debate. Um, so just before we, we start, uh, I just want to launch a very quick poll um just to ask you two very quick questions so um i'll just give you a minute before i hand over to ricardo to just respond Okay, so uh, we're asking, are you familiar with the concept of degrowth and what it proposes? So uh, I think, uh, Ricardo, you can see there's an open audience for you. And the second question, do you think it's possible to decouple economic growth for environmental degradation? Uh, again, a little bit of a, a split poll. So without further ado, Ricardo, over to you. Um, you should be able to... Yep, thank you, Liam, thank you. And uh, I'm very glad to be here with you today to discuss about growth and how it can be relevant to the debate on communities uh, resilience. And uh, the disclaimer with which I want to start is that uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm a social scientist, and I cannot draw a straight line even with the ruler, uh, let alone calculate the maximum traffic loading of a bridge. Therefore, all I can try and engineer is a utopia. And uh, that's precisely what I'll try to do today by discussing the theory of, of the growth. And the reason why I think that the growth is relevant to the debate on communities resilience is because our present obsession with economic growth makes us not resilient to changing conditions around us. Uh, the ideology of the growth, uh, of, of growth, uh, excuse me, peddles the illusion that only a one-way future exists, one in which material production can be expanded at will, and that this is essential for human flourishing. So the reason uh, uh, for this is because uh, uh, we have been subject to this ideology of growthism, and. Uh, we haven't been able to think in terms of how a resilient and sustainable and a flourishing uh, community should, should look like. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that the present pandemic is a manifestation of the ecological crisis. And I think that the ideology of, of growth is in the present conjunction showing all its deadliness because at this present moment we should uh, be willing to downscale production and therefore consumption in order to prevent people from having to go to work in offices and factories and therefore minimize the risk of them uh, being infected with the coronavirus. But of course, this seems to be uh, something that is uh, not uh, uh, presented to us as, as a democratic choice. Uh, so, as you may see, uh, the pandemic and the ecological crisis uh, are driven by the same obsession with productivism, I would, I would define it. And uh, while change is difficult, uh, change we must, because there is no miraculous techno fix uh, to the climate crisis. 
and a new vaccine around the corner for the global ecological breakdown. And the reason for this is because the crisis, the ecological crisis, is the result of the way in which we have transformed the biosphere to serve the narrow logic of economic efficiency. And it's precisely at this narrow logic of economicism that the growth take aims. So I would say that the growth at its core uh, postulates that it's, it is possible to decrease uh, uh, production and consumption of goods and services while increasing social well-being and ecological resilience. The central proposition of the growth is that the correlation between GDP and the human welfare breaks down after a certain point. And most industrialized countries hit that point at, at around the end of the 70s and have not seen any net progress in their welfare indicators in the last half a century. In fact, the assumption that growth is good for well-being is contested by researchers. In most Western countries, the number of people reporting to be uh, very happy has rem remained more or less the same despite continuous growth over the past half a century. And if you think of it, that growth does not have a long-term impact on personal well-being makes sense after all. In a class system like ours, one's social status depends on position and growth increases average, not relative incomes and position. So having today what a richer person had yesterday may give you temporary satisfaction, but tomorrow you still have less than others. Frustration returns as your preferences adapt to what you already have. And as you make comparisons and still find yourself wanting. So basically that's how the consumerist the treadmill works. This being said, the theory of the growth does not only argue that the correlation between GDP and the human welfare breaks down after a certain point, but also that more GDP growth begins to have a negative impact after a certain point. So growth becomes, so to speak, uneconomic. And indeed, the continued pursuit of growth drives environmental destruction. To discuss this last claim, I'll start by giving you a figure that sets the scene for the conversation I think we should have. So if the global economy continues to grow at the usual rate of 2-3% per year, then in the next 30 years, it will consume as much energy and materials as we did cumulatively over the past 10,000 years. The key thing to grasp here is that the increase in material and energy use tracks more or less exactly with the rise of global GDP. The two have grown together in lockstep. Every additional unit of GDP growth means an additional unit of material extraction. And since the year 2000, the growth of material use has outpaced the growth of GDP. So until the 2000s, for, for one decade, it seemed like that we have been able to achieve some sort of relative decoupling. So the global economy was growing at a faster rate than the global material throughput. But since the 2000s, there has been a recoupling of these two indicators. So instead of gradually dematerializing the global economy, we have been rematerializing it. And because GDP is driving energy demand up at such a rapid pace, Renewable energy is not replacing fossil fuels, but it is being added on top of them. For instance, today the world is producing 8 billion more megawatt hours of clean energy each year than in the year 2000. That's a lot. It's actually enough to power the whole of Russia. But over the exact same period of time, economic growth has caused energy demand at the global level to increase by 48 billion megawatt hours. So in other words, all the clean energy that we've been rolling out covers only a small fraction of uh, new demand for energy. And with business as usual growth, the global economy is set to roughly triple in size by the middle of the century. That's three times more extraction and production that we are presently doing. 
and all of which will suck up nearly three times as much end use energy. So it will be unimaginably difficult for us to decarbonize the existing global economy in the short, time, in the short uh, time period that we have left to stay within the remaining carbon budget, but it will be simply impossible to do it three times over. It would require that we decarbonize the global economy at a rate of 12% per year. That's more than five times faster than the historic rate of decarbonization and three times faster than what scientists project is achievable even under highly optimistic conditions. And even more worrying is the fact that some recent studies have put forward an incredible amount of empirical evidence proving that decoupling economic growth from environmental pressure anywhere near the scale needed to deal with the ecological crisis is not happening. But even more problematic than this is that this study show that such decoupling appears unlikely to happen even in the future. So it's not just that, well, we haven't achieved it so far because we haven't set up the right policies. Surely we are a long way from adopting the right policies. But studies that have trying to factor into their models some of the most progressive, some of the most aggressive um, policies for decarbonization uh, reveal the fact that we cannot decarbonize a growing global economy within the limited time period allowed to us uh, by the uh, carbon budget, by the remaining carbon budget. And uh, related to this point, so to the point of, of energy use, I want to uh, make clear the fact that the majority of energy is not consumed by households, but rather by industry. So the best way to reduce energy use is to focus not on energy itself, but rather on the material throughput of the economy. It may seem counterintuitive that the solution to the problem of emissions has to do with materials. However, what's so brilliant about a strategy of, the scale, of downscaling material use is that it helps not only to solve the climate crisis by obviously making the transition to renewable energies more rapid, but it allows us also to solve all the other dimensions of the ecological breakdown, going from deforestation to biodiversity collapse. Because all these environmental impacts are caused by excess material extraction and waste production. So we might say that focusing on materials in order to decarbonizing the economy is an ecologically coherent solution, since it allows us to tackle several environmental impacts at the same time. So after sketching out uh, these, uh, these uh, numbers, just uh, to, to give you a sense, I think, of, of the situation we are in, uh, many of you, I think, will be wondering uh, by this point how we can ensure uh, basically that the essentials of life for citizens are uh, met, are provided in the context of an economy that doesn't grow. Well, the truth is that the interventions that matter when it comes to improving human welfare, do not require high levels of GDP. Proof of that is that the European Union as a whole has 36% less income than the United States. And yet the European Union beats the US not only on life expectancy, but on virtually every indicator of human welfare. But there are even uh, countries that are usually defined as developing countries that manage to achieve high levels of human welfare with low GDP per capita. For example, Costa Rica in uh, Central America surpasses the United States on many welfare indicators with a GDP per capita that is only one seventh that of the United States. So you might argue that the remaining sixth seventh of the GDP in the US is not pro providing any, qual any uh, improvements in the quality of life of their citizens. And the question, of course, that comes to mind at this point is what can explain such remarkable results? Well, the thing is that when it comes to delivering long, healthy, flourishing lives for all, what counts is investing in high quality, universal public services, which are significantly more cost efficient to run 
than their private counterparts. However, since the 80s, endless waves of privatization have been uh, unleashed all over the world on, services, on public services such as education, healthcare, transportation, housing, and even social security. So social goods are everywhere under attack. And this is a purposeful strategy. The idea is that by making public goods artificially scarce, people will have no choice but to purchase private alternatives, meaning that citizens end up paying to acquire goods that used to be accessed for free. And what happens when you enclose a public good that used to be accessed for free by the citizens? Well, obviously, GDP grows. GDP grows because money changes hands. And so we could say that what happens when you enclose these public goods is that you create artificial scarcity. Hence, scarcity and growth create a self-reinforcing loop. So follow me here. To stimulate growth, we need to enclose public goods. And to have the means to access these public goods, well, then you need to have growth to ensure that everybody has the purchasing power to access these public goods. But uh, so this has been the logic of neoliberalism. I mean, this is the recipe for growth that is peddled by neoliberalism. But if we try to flip this logic, we might argue that if scarcity is created for the sake of growth, as I just explained, well, then by reversing artificial scarcity, we can render growth unnecessary. By de-enclosing and expanding the commons, we can enable people to access the goods that they need to live well without needing high levels of income and therefore additional growth. In such transition, people would be able to work less without any loss to their quality of life and at the same time produce less unnecessary stuff through their jobs and also generating less pressure on the biosphere as a consequence of that. So while it's true that the economy would be smaller in GDP terms, it would be more abundant in terms of welfare. So just to summarize in, in a nutshell, we could say that the growth calls for abundance in order to render growth unnecessary. So I hope that by this point I've convinced uh, most of you, so let's say the remaining 70% of the people in the poll that uh, were, uh, were skeptic about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, how we can bring about uh, a prosperity without growth. So I hope that I have somehow convinced most of you of the fact that to ensure well-being, we don't need economic growth. But of course, many think that this applies or that this makes sense only as a discussion within wealthy countries. And many of you may be wondering, what about countries in the global south. So, of course, one of the most common criticisms of the growth is that it ignores the need for increasing income in the global south. And the question is usually articulated in these terms. Either we stop the growth machine for the sake of ecological stabilities and as a consequence of that sacrifice the poor and leave them to, to be poor, or we improve the lives of the poor, but sacrifice the ecology on which we depend. It seems like it's a double bind. But fortunately, I would argue there is a way out of this. And the key is to recognize that we don't live in a poor world that needs more growth. On the contrary, we live in a world that is already incredibly rich. We have more than enough to end global poverty many times over. The problem is just that it's all captured at the very top. So when we usually think of the global poor, we tend to imagine people who are somehow cut off from the world economy. People who live in backwaters untouched by globalizations, unconnected from the lives of people who live in Europe and North America. But this image gives us completely the wrong impression. The fact is that the poor 60% of humanity are deeply integrated into the circuits of global capital. They work in the sweatshops of multinational companies. They spend their lives mining the rare earth minerals that we depend on for our smartphones and laptops. 
They harvest the tea leaves and coffee beans and sugar cane that most people consume every day. They pick the berries and bananas that Europeans and North Americans eat every morning for breakfast. And in many cases, theirs is the land from which the oil and coal and gas that powers the global economy is extracted. So all these things told, it's clear that these people contribute the vast majority of the labor and resources that go into the global economy. And yet, in return, they receive only 5% of total global income on average. By contrast, the vast majority of new income from global growth has gone to the world's rich. The figures are pretty staggering. So the richest 1% alone capture 19 trillion in, uh, of dollars in income every year, which represents nearly a quarter of global GDP. So the rich lay claim to a truly staggering share of the income that the global economy generates, which is extracted from the bodies and the lands of, of, of the poor. Since 1980, 28% of new income from global GDP growth has gone to the richest 1%. So a third of all the economic growth has gone to the benefit of the 1%. And it's not only 30% of, of GDP growth that went to them, but you have to think of, of what stands beyond that economic growth. So we can say that in other words, nearly a third of all the labor that we have rendered, all the resources that we have extracted, and all the CO2 we have emitted over the past half a century has been to make the rich people just richer. So it makes little sense, in my opinion, to call for more growth in order to improve the lives of the poor when the vast majority of it just goes straight, just goes straight to the already rich. A recent study found that given the existing rate at which income from growth trickles down to the poor, it will take about 200 years to bring everyone in the world above the poverty line. And to get there, we will need to grow the global GDP to 175 times its present size. That's 175 times more extraction and production and consumption that we are already doing. The scale of this is, in my opinion, all refined to contemplate. As a strategy for ending poverty, this approach is terribly inefficient and ecologically insane. This is wildly out of step with any understanding of planetary boundaries. So there is simply no way this can be achieved without triggering truly catastrophic climate change, which, apart from anything else, would obliterate any potential gains from poverty reduction. The truth is that we do not need aggregate global growth to end poverty. To bring everyone in the world above the poverty line of 7.40 uh, cents per day would require about $6 trillion. That's a significant sum on the face of it. But notice that it's only one third of the annual income of the richest 1%. So by shifting $6 trillion of excess income from the richest 1% to the poorest 4.2 billion people in the world, we could end the poverty in a stroke and still leave the richest with average annual incomes of nearly $200,000 per year more than anyone could ever reasonably need to live a good life. So when we think about the growth conundrum from this angle, the supposed double, blind, double bind excuse me, between ending mass poverty and restoring ecological stability melts away and reveals a much easier choice between living in a more equitable society on the one end and risking ecological catastrophe on the other. And I believe that most people would have little difficulty choosing between the two. So I'll leave my opening remarks at this and I look forward to the Q&A where we can dig more into the growth and some of maybe figures or ideas that they discussed. Thanks very much, Ricardo. Uh, a very thought-provoking I cannot hear you. Now, sorry. So we have, uh, 
Well, maybe just we have some comments and questions, Ricardo. Uh, I have one to start the ball rolling. Um, and it's about, well, a couple of questions, but one uh, really about uh, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, as they're presented as a framework for development for the next 30 uh, to 2030. Um, and they seem to contradict a little bit with some of your comments there around uh, what you present as a framework for sustainable uh, development, really. And I'm just wondering what your own thoughts are on the contradictions inherent. Uh, do you view the SDGs as still relevant or, or what's your thoughts around them, particularly along the lines of what you've been discussing for the last 20 minutes or so? All right. Thanks, Liam. Um, yes, I mean, I think the SDGs are a valuable framework, but I think they are tarnished by this uh, um, obsession with growth that runs as a, as a fear rouge all across um, the proposals, in the sense that I think they put forward some holistic indicators that would allow us to understand the, the direction in which we would like to take uh, let's say the global economy, communities around the world. But then of course, there is this constant contradiction in which the science is pretty clear on the matter. And while many people might associate the growth with some fringe idea and you know, peddled just by activists, of course, many of us are also activists, but I think that by now, the empirical evidence is crushing in the sense that um, more and more scientific papers are coming out, uh, out uh, every, every week, literally, on this matter. Uh, 12,000 uh, 12, scientists signed a document a few, years, a few months back in 2019, um, taking a clear sense on the fact that we cannot uh, keep on increasing uh, production and consumption uh, while decreasing throughput, at least at, uh, uh, let's say, the speed that we need uh, in order to stay between, uh, within uh, the uh, carbon budget. So let's say that uh, there is a difference between something that is uh, uh, good and something that is good enough. So, of course, uh, research for uh, green technologies and innovative ways of production and, and consumption as well should be further pursued. But at the same time, we should adopt a, a position, I think, of, of precaution. And I think uh, uh, this is something that we can learn from the pandemic. Uh, there are many lessons that, of course, we can, uh, we can draw from uh, the past few months, but I think that the most uh, uh, relevant one is the fact that when we are faced with a crisis that endangers the well-being of a vast uh, portion of, of our communities, what we should do is impose a strict limits, regardless of the impact that this will have on the economy. So in the case of the pandemic and the lockdown, the, um, the strict limit was stay home. In the context of the ecological crisis should be, this is how much we can emit every year. As much economic growth we can, ha we can have within this cap, within this, let's say, bonded ability of extracting resources and generating wa waste, well, we can have it. And of course, that growth should be redistributed as fairly as, as possible. So to me, it seems that that's a moral hazard, saying we want all these beautiful objectives enshrined in the SDGs, but we don't want to give up growth. I think that there is a conflict there that at some point we need to, to face and if not do away with the SDGs, at least uh, remove this uh, element that, uh, that subverts all the other goals. Okay, very good. Now, just uh, a couple of questions coming in for you and, and comments. Um, and some actually just touching on, on your response there. One question is, how do you think that citizens will have enough trust in politicians to make drastic decisions in reductions such as resource cap? So relating to trust in politicians, uh, What's your thoughts? Right. Right. Um, so here I'm stepping out. Uh, I'm taking off my hat as a scientist and <laughs> purely okay. now speaking my point of view as a, as, as a citizen. Of course, I think that this is a constantly, uh, it's a constant struggle. I mean, it's a constant negotiation that we as a society need to have. I mean, trust is, of course, the glue that keeps, that keeps us together. And of course, history is rife with moments in which that glue, you know, kind of fades away and uh, we, we, we fall apart. If uh, I think of what happened over the past few months, again, with the pandemic, because I think the conversation we can have 
today is radically different from the conversation we could have had just you know one year ago potentially even just six months ago well i should do the math so i don't know if six months ago uh, the lockdown had already started but the point being is that i think that there has been a remarkable amount of support that has been placed by the vast majority of citizens towards institutions in order to steer uh, uh, the uh, to steer uh, the, the boat away from uh, the, the dangers of the pandemic. I think we live in time, uh, the past few months have been times of in incredible institutional dirigism, we might, we might call it, interventionism. After 30 years of the state stepping back and just uh, trying to let the market govern uh, society and solve our issues, we have understood once again the importance of having political decisions, of having institutions that direct the market. And of course, there are countless examples of this. I mean, the state stepped in to uh, prevent landlords to evict tenants or to freeze uh, the, uh, the payment of utility bills or freezing uh, the firing of workers, not to speak, of course, of um, exp uh, of, uh, of taking control of certain factories to produce the essentials that were needed, uh, such as uh, surgical masks, uh, uh, disinfectants, and putting price controls on how much these products could be sold. So all of a sudden, I have seen uh, I'm, I'm 32 years old, so I was born and, and, and raised in times of neoliberalism. I, didn't, I have never known a time where in the West uh, there could be such a strong role played by institutions. And after all these months, I think that uh, there is still a great trust that many of us are placing in those institutions because I think that uh, we have realized that uh, uh, politicians are often held in check by powerful lobbies, but uh, if there is, I think, a sense of a generalized risk, something that is perceived by the people as something that is really putting their lives at, at risk, well, the politicians are forced to do the bidding of citizens. I don't want to indulge in wishful thinking. It's a constant struggle. I'm not saying everywhere in the world it went well, but uh, I think that we should be heartened by what uh, we saw in the past few months. Okay. I'm just, uh, just conscious, Ricardo, I'd like to cover a few questions. There's um, a comment and a question coming, coming together. I, I'll just take them in no particular order. Um, excellent viewpoints presented with logical analysis and arguments. However, these convictions have been expressed for a very long time by development experts across many parts of the world. Despite that, disparities at all levels, global, regional, national, have rather been growing and living conditions of many people, especially in the poorest countries, have not really been improving even today. Corruption is rampant, and uh, metacratic systems is virtually absent in many cases. So the question, what do you suggest as the most effective means to overcoming this kind of vicious cycle of deprivation and underdevelopment amidst the growing opulence in certain pockets and amongst a lim limited number of people? Uh, well, that's a, that's a big question. A nice easy one for you, Ricardo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, well, yes, I am. I am sure that what uh, what uh, I what I said today and what many of us have been working on for the past, uh, you know, few years, it's not an overt. I mean, the growth, uh, even though for many of the terms that has come, uh, let's say, to prominence only the past few years, uh, its roots are are are. Um, go deep. Uh, there is, of course, a stronger tradition of post-development thinking that the growth borrows many of these concepts from. So, uh, absolutely, I mean, this is uh, this has been going on for for a long time, and unfortunately, we don't have much probab probably to to prove for right after all these years. So, why would it be different now? Um, I don't honestly have a any shortcut to suggest, if not the one of carry on a struggle. Uh, what I would say maybe is that uh, what we are trying to do uh, with, uh, with uh, the concept of the growth is providing some coherent framework in which I think we can better understand the relationship between wealth creation and wealth appropriation. And just as the pursuit of growth, it's not just a matter that it should be greener, it should be more inclusive, but that growth is always based on exploitation, exploitation of people, so bodies, and exploitation of ecosystem, therefore lands, you know. So I think that maybe something that was, was overlooked was somehow the dimension in which uh, okay, this GDP should, uh, let's say, this economic growth should be better redistributed, but I don't know how much, uh, let's say, at, at, at a more um, 
uh, let's say, comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive level we have done in questioning just the pursuit of growth in the first place and understanding how much of it is uneconomic and it actually drives us away from our goal. I don't know how good of an answer that is, but uh, it's no, what I thank say you, Ricardo. And just a follow on question to that is uh, I think an interesting point, and you, you touched on a little bit there. Is the growth theory solely focused on GDP? What are the other measures that need to degrow, for example, the cities? Um, and I'll, I'll combine that with another linked question. Um, how do we measure efficient and sufficient welfare? So is it purely GDP or are we talking about degrowth in terms of lifestyle, uh, living, et cetera? And how then do we measure uh, these type of things? Right. Um, okay. Um, so a common uh, um, misconception about the growth is that the goal of the growth is to reduce GDP. Actually, that's far from the truth. Since we question the use of GDP as an indicator, as a meaningful and as a useful indicator, of course, we don't obsess over it. So the, what we propose that you should the growth is throughput. So the amount of energy and materials that uh, that uh, uh, the social metabolism, so our cities, our, our, let's say, industrialized societies consume in order to maintain itself and expand itself. So we focus on materials and energy. But our hypothesis is that reducing material and energy through, throughput within the, uh, within the limits of the rapidly declining carbon budget and to keep uh, the global economy within the planetary boundaries, well, that, that's most likely going to take a hit on GDP. So we don't focus on GDP, we just think that the GDP will be affected and therefore we need to go one step forward. It's not just that we are calling for decreasing throughput, but we also need to set up institutions fast enough in order to cope with an economy that doesn't grow. Okay, I don't know if, if, if uh, this is a bit uh, clearer now. And of course, this opens the discussion about, uh, about uh, different indicators. So of course, there is lots of discussion uh, also beyond, let's say, the growth circles around the need for using a more uh, relevant, let's say, more holistic indicators. Uh, I'm all in favor of it. Um, speaking of which, actually, um, I suggest the people to look, look up the um, Human uh, Sustainable Index. You can find it at the web address humansustainableindex.org, in which basically there is a, a global ranking of countries based on some metrics that I think are well in line with what the growth proposes. Because it takes basically the Human Development Index and then it uh, puts it in relation with the average ecological footprint of each country. So the countries that rise to the top are not the ones that have, uh, let's say, human development index indicators at the highest levels, but those that reach high levels while maintaining a low ecological footprint. So we understand that these two indicators should be in a constant relation with one another. Of course, you have a very developed and flourishing society, but with an unsustainable carbon or ecological footprint, well, that doesn't say much, I think, about this as a model to be replicated around the world. So I think that the debate on indicators is very important. So first, we should not obsess on GDP because we cannot ignore it to death, but we should not focus on that as what we needed to, to decrease. At the same time, we needed to develop more holistic indicators, but we should not, in my opinion, fall into the trap of focusing only on indicators because this debate on beyond the GDP has been going on for many years. Actually, uh, since before we went live, we were talking about European institutions, the European Parliament, uh, almost 10 years ago, organized the Beyond the GDP conference. So, you know, the discussion was about overcoming this indicator and having better ones. But the point is that the growth I'm talking about is an integrated process. It's not that if we ignore GDP, then all our problems go away. Because, you know, the state finance itself based on, on, on GDP. Uh, our debt-based monetary system is reliant on having a constant increase in order to maintain some balance between the money supply and the real economy. So changing the indicators is a step in the right direction, but we should not fall into the trap of thinking that uh, that's some sort of way of getting out of this impasse. Excellent, thanks Ricardo. And I'll just throw uh, two questions together at you. Uh, so thanks for the great talk. I want to ask how to practice and materialize this degrowth ideology. Does it start at the local, national, or global level? And combined with that, so how someone leaving today, what do they do? Is it local? Is it national? Is it global? 
And a second question is, um, you know, is, is it possible for Ireland to apply a degrowth uh, concept while remaining within the EU? Or would they have to leave the EU to retain um, financial sovereignty? All right. So two, two linked questions, what to do, local, national, global, and then the okay. Irish context, same for Italy, same for France, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. how does it work? Okay, well, um, so to address the first question, uh, uh, of course, the easy answer would be we have to operate at all levels, but I'll try to be a bit more nuanced in my response. So I think that historically, uh, the climate justice movement and let's say the growth, which is a part of this global uh, just, uh, uh, climate justice movement, and to focus so very much on the local and the international level, right? The, uh, you know, the motto, uh, right, uh, uh, think global, act local. So the idea is that we needed to build the resilient communities on the ground, and at the same time, we needed to find uh, some uh, uh, global agreement on the carbonization uh, pathways and so on and so forth. While I think that, of course, these two dimensions are absolutely important, and we should uh, keep on working on them. What I think has changed over the past couple of years is the emphasis that is being placed at the national level. And of course, I think that the most prominent political discourse with regard to this is the one of the Green New Deal, um, which, which understands that in order to steer this ocean liner on which we are on, we cannot just rely on the, on the goodwill of local citizens or just having some uh, international agreements being signed, but we need institutions to be transformed in order to ensure uh, basically the pu public uh, uh, well-being in the context of a very deep uh, transformation. So, of course, some of the policies that uh, many degrowth researchers work on now, such as uh, uh, expanding the public goods, work time reduction, transforming uh, the monetary system, all these things need a strong institutional intervention from the part of the state. So I think that uh, while we needed to operate at all these levels, somehow I think that the, what was for a long time neglected, meaning this intermediate level between global and local, so the national one has come back, I think, with a vengeance. And that's why I think that the Green New Deal is a very promising discourse. Uh, my, my research actually focuses on the, inter on the interaction between the Green New Deal political discourse and the growth theory. So it's something quite, uh, quite dear to my heart. And this, of course, leads to the next question uh, about Ireland. Of course, I'm not an expert about Ireland, but uh, I believe that uh, the situation when it comes to these big macro questions, the situation Ireland is, is very similar to the situation of, let's say, Italy's in my home countries. I think that uh, uh, there is surely a role to be played at the European level because a certain degree of uh, common, um, let's say, strategy for, for decarbonizing the continent should absolutely be go governed at, uh, at a, su a supranational level. But at the same time, I am quite uh, skeptic of placing too much faith in institutions which were built and deliberately built with uh, neoliberal principles baked into it. I think it's no coincidence the fact that the most progressive, uh, let's say green left uh, movements are now rising in the United States. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because there is this sense in which if we take power, you know, if our representatives take power, we can take the levers of power through which we can steer enough course. Within the European Union, this becomes very difficult. I mean, look at the European Green Deal. I want to get into details now, but I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a misappropriation of the concept of the Green New Deal because it has neoliberal elements baked into it. So it doesn't question the dogmas of austerity, it doesn't question the dogmas of free trade, it doesn't uh, question the dogmas of, um, of, uh, of uh, internal competition. So I think that uh, I'm not vouching that to, uh, to embrace, uh, let's say, a, a radical Green New Deal a, a, a member state needs to leave the European Union, but we needed to transform it very radically. And of course, I don't know if this will, will happen before a further fracturing of, of the Union. And just, uh, just one or two quick last ones. Um, I suppose one question that a lot of our audience, for example, will be going back to work now in their various private sector companies. We have a lot of young engineers and, uh, and not so young engineers like myself. Um, working and, and one of the questions touches on that. So how do you incentivize large private sector companies 
who of course hold a lot of influence to change business as usual in pursuit of growth when they seemingly have a lot to lose through this degrowth or redistribution. So at a, at a private sector level, where as you well know, particularly the drivers of the European Green Deal, a lot of them have been private yeah. sector companies. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on, at, at that level? Um, honestly, I don't know how good the growth can do to big businesses, maybe none. And uh, I, I don't think we should be afraid of, 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 of questioning that. I mean, of course, it's not that I don't think that there is a role for entrepreneurship, a role, of course, you know, for... Uh, uh, business uh, businesses to rise to the challenge and innovate and transform. I mean, uh, I, I totally believe in that. But I don't know, this makes me question, like, is there a, a scale at which, uh, beyond which this is actually not feasible? I mean, uh, uh, of course, it depends what scale we're talking about. If you're thinking of big multinational businesses where decisions are taken far away from the places where the consequences of uh, productive choices are made. I mean, how can, we act, how can we make sure that those uh, shareholders, the people actually making decisions, which is an incredibly narrow slice of our population, uh, in the sense, if you look at the stock market, it's highly concentrated in the hands of the richest 1%. Well, maybe there is no way out of it without downsizing these businesses, relocalizing them, and maybe having more participatory decision-making processes on, on what to produce, how to produce, where to produce it. And having workers and local communities as part of business boards where these decisions can be made. Because if you are an entrepreneur that lives in the in the in the in the area where your factory is placed, well, you're going to be much more careful uh, with uh, not contaminating the water table of, of that region, you know, of your own community where you live, rather than if it's uh, just uh, held by a holding uh, place in some, um, in some uh, exotic island. So, of course, this, I, I don't have some exact answer on what is the right size of business. I would say that uh, within the growth literature, there is lots of space that is devoted about reflecting about how cooperatives, how not-for-profit businesses are better placed to navigate this transformation. Uh, many people believe that in capitalism, there is a baked-in growth imperative that cannot be overcome. I think that is a big theoretical question that I don't want to be drugged into. So I'm not saying we must, do, we must kill capitalism before we can, uh, um, uh, we can start this transition. But I think that this transition will force us to question many, uh, many values that we hold dear at the moment. And one of them is, I think, these uh, big businesses and multinationals. And, and, and just a question for myself, I suppose, uh, and I know this has been discussed before, the whole term degrowth. Uh, on a personal level, I find, and for example, in Ireland, we, we have bitter experience recently with um, recessions and people losing houses, losing jobs. And I find the, the, the term itself tends to turn uh, some people off in that it has a negative connotation. Now, I know it's entirely the opposite as you've described today, but do you think the term itself is a bit of a limitation and that we should be talking uh, in, in a new terms uh, now for, for this post-COVID world? I think uh, that, I mean, this is a long running debate and actually mm. the term originates as, um, as, uh, as uh, uh, I, I don't find the word in English anyway, in French, it was defined as an explosive term, something that should kind of subvert the, the hegemonic uh, way of thinking. So just uh, kind of creating a moment of puzzlement in your interlocutor so that you can open up a space in which uh, somehow uh, I can say like you cannot uh, so easily like duck away from questions of like isn't growth or driving all these social ills. This being said, I do think that uh, we need inclusive terms. We need the terminology that uh, can make it easier to appeal to people and bring also different, uh, let's say, uh, constituencies together. So I personally um, use the term degrowth only in, specific, in a specific context. I am not religious about it. I think we should be absolutely willing to questioning. Uh, so yes, it, it, might be, uh, it might go to the detriment of the cause. Uh, at the same time, I think that 
it presents a very strategic advantage, which is the one that is, it cannot be co-opted. So while all the other terms, you know, sustainable development, um, I don't know, you name them, you know, like, uh, you name it, so many others have been appropriated, you know, circular economy. And now, of course, uh, big business can just say that, oh, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, you know, to jump on the degrowth bandwagon if you're Amazon. So <laughs> maybe in a way, <laughs> this can prevent us from, uh, can prevent, uh, let's say, these this, uh, demands, this uh, theory to be appropriated. But at the same time, well, it's a double-edged sword. It cannot be appropriated by our enemies, but maybe it's, deep, it's uh, uh, reluctantly assumed by our, our allies. So we need to strategize probably about it. Okay. And, and last, very quick one. What's your thoughts on what's happening in New Zealand at the moment? New Zealand is being held up as one of the economies that um, is, is really adopting this degrowth policy. And in their, in their budget, I read that they're, rather than measuring GDP, they're putting targets on five different metrics. Yeah. Uh, is, is, it, is it actually an example of a country that's uh, adopting degrowth and trying to bring it forward? Um. New Zealand, along with Scotland as well, so they've joined this Wellbeing Eco Economy Alliance, of which I'm a fellow. So it's a, this a global think tank that advises institutions on how to embrace, uh, let's say, more holistic uh, form of uh, social development. I think it's a step in the right direction, but I will refer back to what I was saying before about the indicators. I think a changing indicators is essential because if you cannot measure something, it's very hard to change it. But at the same time, we should not uh, mistake the indicator for the actual thing that we wanted to, to change. So while being a step in the right direction, I think it's still far away from it. I will refer back also to the uh, Human Sustainable Index that I mentioned before. People can go and check out the first 10 countries that are on that list. And uh, you will realize that even if there are countries that maybe they don't talk a big game about uh, other indicators and so on, have actually been able to find a way of square uh, having a good level of human development with a low ecological footprint. A disclaimer I will add to this, this doesn't apply to politics, uh, to the political system, because for example, Cuba is, is one of the uh, highest ranking countries. This doesn't mean that we vouch for Marxism-Leninism in the sense that, of course, the question is like, how can we ensure good public goods with low ecological footprint, but that doesn't have a, a, let's say a relation with uh, uh, with the political system. So we are let's say agnostic about that. Of course, uh, I would I would wish uh, to have it uh, within a democratic framework. This kind of, of transition. So I think those countries maybe are more interesting examples than than uh, New Zealand. And I'm being provocative here. Okay. Well, listen. Uh, you'll be glad to know that uh, <laughs> most of our audience now have a better understanding. Um, and I include myself in that. So thanks very much for a very thought-provoking and, and informative discussion. Um, and I think really, uh, you're right, it's, it's about uh, really bringing the discussion forward because the status quo is not an option. Whether you, whether you argue uh, whatever framework, I think really COVID has taught us that people can change um, and politicians and society can actually work uh, in unison. Um, and as you said, there are certain conversations that we can have now that possibly you couldn't have in a, in a pre-COVID world. Um, so Ricardo, thanks very much for uh, your thoughts today. And just to all our attendees, we will share um, Ricardo's um, contact details. And if anyone wants to follow up, we'll put them on our website. If anyone wants to follow up with Ricardo directly, I presume, uh, Ricardo, they can contact you and, and uh, engage in the discussion. Absolutely. And then just uh, finally to say next week's webinar, actually, is uh, rather topical following what Ricardo has been talking about. We have uh, Pradita Pradhan, who is program coordinator with Field Ready, who are one of our partners in Nepal. And uh, Pradita is going to be talking about local production and um, how eliminating large supply chains can really, really make local communities resilient. Um, so tune in next week for that, Ricardo. Thanks very much. And uh, hopefully when, when the world starts spinning again, we'll see you in Barcelona sometime. I hope so. Thanks to everyone for attending. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.